change that we're going to try to take going forward, if you'll notice the QR code on the screen, if you shoot that with your phone, it'll take you straight to uh, where you can download the workbook for this class, really all of the chapters, uh, the workbook, which is basically just my personal notes that I put together so I can remember what it is that I'm teaching. Uh, but that'll give you a quick access to that. Uh, if, you, if you're not comfortable with QR codes, the workbook is on our website. Uh, if you just go to the Servant Archives to the Romans series, it's the very first uh, uh, member in the series. And you'll be able to download it to your computer there if you like. So we are going to look at chapter 6 of the book of Romans. And let me make a couple of comments. The book of Romans is the single most important book in the New Testament. Uh, if you had no other book and you only had the book of Romans, that is enough there for you to understand what salvation is and to be properly discipled uh, in, in regard to God's redemption plan. But of the entire book of Romans, chapter 6, I think, is the single most important chapter uh, of the most important book that's in the New Testament. So tonight, we're going to slow down a little bit. We're going to look at the grammar. Uh, I challenge you to really stay focused on how, how as we move through the uh, text, so that you can follow step by step by step. If you do not know and understand chapter 6, 7, and 8, you've not been properly discipled in Christianity and probably have some degree of works uh, in your salvation experience, which will only degrade your Christian walk. And so uh, we'll look at chapter 6 tonight. Now, before I get into the very first verse, um, I do want to give an overview of what happens when a person is born again. We, we have a big confusion in the church now because we have so many people in the church who are not really born again. Uh, they're, they're church attenders. Uh, and sometimes it's hard for us to see who, who, who is saved, who isn't saved, what is born again. Is it just a catchphrase or is it something real? And so I want to talk about that before we get into chapter 6. When a person is born again, the first thing that must happen is the exhibition of faith. That person must evidence some degree, uh, no matter how undeveloped, but some degree of faith in Jesus Christ. As soon as the Holy Spirit sees that faith, saving faith, not just a confession, but saving faith, the Holy Spirit immediately takes that believing sinner, and baptizes him into Christ. Now, I want to understand the terminology. The word baptize, when Paul wrote this epistle, uh, is, was not used like it's used now. The word baptize just simply means to submerge or to immerse something. And so all Paul was really saying was submerge. We, we use it differently in, in modern Christianity. It's primarily when somebody is water baptized. <coughs> And so what Paul is saying then is that the person is baptized, they are submerged into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit sees saving faith, picks that believer up out of the body of the first Adam in which all are physically born, and then submerges him into the body of the last Adam, making him a member of the body of Christ. Now, it's, there's a vast difference between being a member of a church and a member of the body of Christ. And so the next thing that will happen then, once the Holy Spirit submerges that person into Christ, the person receives from God a status of sanctified. That means that God sees that believing sinner based on his faith, sees him as absolutely perfect. Uh, a type of this is when God uh, dwelt between the cherubim above the mercy seat. When he looked down at the broken law that was in that ark, the blood of the sacrifice was on the mercy seat and God saw the blood. So it is that when God looks at a man or a woman that has been baptized in the body of Christ, he doesn't see you, he sees his son. And he sees his son as absolutely perfect. So your status before God in heaven is absolute perfection. 
you're not really perfect, but God sees you as perfect. So evidencing faith, baptized into Christ, a, a status of uh, sanctified, and then you receive from God the declaration of justified by your faith. Being justified is a legal process in the barroom of heaven. Every human being, when they are born, they are born in a legal status of condemnation. But once they give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, God gives them a decree of justified, justification by faith. We're no longer condemned. We're now justified. Now, all of this happens in a nanosecond, in the twinkle of an eye. This is not a four-week process. This happens immediately so fast as soon as we evidence faith. Happens in just a moment's time. But then, uh, and this is what we call being born again or the initial salvation experience. Initial salvation experience. But then there's this process that's the rest of your life that's called progressive sanctification. You have a status of perfect with God. So now the Holy Spirit works on the backside to try to give your everyday, get your everyday practical life up to your status so that you're walking where God sees you at. And believe me, it's a lifelong process. You get better and better and better. And to some people, <coughs> that could be a little bit disturbing, a little bit discouraging, but it, it, it shouldn't be discouraging at all because it lets you know how good he's making you, how much better he's making you. It lets you know how much higher Christ is in his perfect sanctification than the best one of us are uh, as we are right now. So when Paul in this chapter uh, talks about salvation, when, uh, when he talks about being born again, although he doesn't use that phrase, we need to understand this is what's happening. These are the details that he's talking about. Now, in this sixth chapter, uh, Paul gives us the absolute mechanics of how our salvation works. He gives us the, the nuances and the details of what happened and, and what the expectation will be if we follow out uh, as we should. So we'll just begin with uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Paul asked the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? And as we mentioned in one of the prior sessions, this was uh, Paul's motif. It was his method. He would ask the question that he anticipated his distractors would ask so that he would get a chance to answer it himself uh, rather than someone else try to answer it for him in his absence. So he says, what shall we say then? The, his, his distractors would ask, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? And they're saying, Paul, if what you're preaching is that because men are sinners, that God's grace has been given, they're saying, well, why don't we sin more and we'll get more grace? Now, those type of thoughts can only come from an unconverted heart. Because a person who is converted suddenly has a hatred towards sin. They may not be perfect. They may be stumbling, but they don't like their sin anymore because God has done a change on the inside and they have a different perspective than they ever had before. Nevertheless, Paul asks, asks the question so that he can answer it. And he's going to spend, I think, the first 15 verses of chapter 6 answering this question. And, and Paul is, as you look at his arguments, they are absolutely mind-boggling and in how intelligent this man was to be able to uh, give all of these nuances uh, that he gives. So as we go through this chapter, then we're going to look at uh, the grammar. Uh, we're going to look at the, the grammatical makeup of the phrases. We're going to look at almost every phrase because we, you cannot understand the Bible if you don't understand the verses. And you cannot understand the verses if you don't understand the words. And this has been one of the problems in Christianity is if when we don't understand it, we just make it up. But I guarantee you, if you'll understand the words that are already there, they're better than anything you could have made up. 
And so he says, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? The first word sin, uh, you'll notice if you can remember your high school grammar, uh, is a noun, a person, place, thing, or idea. It's being used as a noun. Sin can be used in one of two ways. It can be used as a noun, person, place, thing, or idea, or it can be used as a verb, an action word. Uh, here it's used as a, noun, as a noun. Shall we continue in sin? Uh, but you could use it as a verb. That guy is sinning. That would be the verb use of it. Whenever it's used as a noun, be it in this chapter or anywhere, it is absolutely always talking about the principle of sin or the sin nature. How many's ever heard of the sin nature? <clears throat> the sin nature is that that we inherited from Adam uh, when he sinned that through the whole human race in separation from God, and we have now a bent towards sin. Nobody has to teach a little child how to lie. It's already in them. You don't have to teach them how to steal. It's, it's already there. You have to teach them how to not do those things. And so Paul is really asking then, shall we continue in our relationship with the sin nature? So that grace might abound. And grace, of course, is unmerited divine assistance. Uh, more simply, is help from God that comes to you through the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. When God gives you help, it's the Holy Spirit that brings it to your door, that, that actually uh, administers that help to you. And so, again, the, the sentence, as we amplify it, based on the definitions that we know, is shall we continue in our relationship with the sin nature so that we can get more help from God? That kind of defeats the purpose of the help, doesn't it? So he's given the answer already uh, in this first phrase. He goes on to say, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So his first response to this question uh, begins to broach the subject of, of what occurred in our lives as, as our initial salvation experience. He says, how shall we that are dead? Wait a minute. What do you mean that we're dead? How did we get dead? He'll tell us in a few moments, but we want to look at the language. He's saying, hey, we that are dead, well, we're still walking around. We're still alive. How is he considering us as being dead? We that are dead to sin, it's a noun, it's speaking of the sin nature. We that are dead to the sin nature, how shall we live any longer therein? Now notice what it says here. It says we that are dead. It does not say the sin nature is dead. The sin nature is very much alive. I don't care how born again you are, how much you speak in tongues. The sin nature is still inside of you and it's constantly reaching out to try to... Uh, uh, execute through your flesh a sinful activity. It's constantly reaching out through lust, trying to grab something because it wants to use your body as an expression of sinful activity. That's what the sin nature does. You can think of the sin nature as the factory of sin. It's that thing inside of you that makes you want what God said you can't have. And Paul is saying how shall we that are dead continue to live in relationship with the sin nature? How, how would that even be possible? There is a truth about death. Death severs every relationship. I've known Sister Lincoln since we were 18 and 19 in high school. Uh, we've been together all of our lives. But if she passes away before I do, I will never kiss her again. I will never hold her hand again. Because death severs every relationship. And Paul is saying, how shall we that are dead, the death that we've uh, encountered has severed us in our relationship with the sin nature. Even though it still abides on the inside, it's dormant on the inside, it is no longer the master and we are no longer the slave because the death that we experience with Jesus Christ has severed that relationship. Death severed the relationship with the sin nature 
and it severs the relationship to the law. Both of those for the born again Christian should have no impact on our life and living. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to the sin, if you look at Young's literal transaction, the word the uh, is what in the Greek is called the definite article. Uh, and it's always there. If the, if the definite article is there, that's an additional way that you know it's talking about the sin nature. How shall we that are dead to the sin live any longer therein? <clears throat> and again, it's not the sin nature that's dead. We're the ones who are dead. We died to the sin nature. So here's a way to think about the sin nature because sometimes it can, um, it, it can just be difficult. And this word picture certainly helps me. If you think of a gallon of gasoline uh, in a gasoline can, if, if you put that, you know, in the garage or you put it, you know, out, out, by, the, uh, out by the shed somewhere and, and put the cap on it, it's, it's no problem at all. It, it offers no danger whatsoever. It's just a gallon of gas. It'll sit there indefinitely as long as nobody messes with it. And the gallon of gasoline is very much like the sin nature for the Christian who has been born again. It's there. It's no problem. It's dormant. However, the activities of sin is like striking matches. It's like striking matches. Now, you might get away and do some sinful activity, and it has no impact, but you keep striking those matches, and you're going to reinvigorate the sin nature, and, and it will once again take dominion over some aspect of your life, some compartmental uh, partitioned access of your life. It will just rage and burn in that area, and you'll find yourself struggling because you've allowed the sin nature to be reinvigorated. And so, so what do you do? You cannot deal with it yourself. You have to go back to God. You have to go back to the Holy Spirit, confess that thing, keep that thing before God. And although, you know, God sometimes, <laughs> you know, if we're just striking matches everywhere, activities of sin, and all of a sudden, we set the whole gallon of gasoline on fire, and we go, oh, my Lord, my life's burning up. This area's burning up. God will help you, but maybe not on the first day. <laughs> I did this. God let the fire burn for seven years. Now, he came in, and he, he blessed me. He put out the fire. He, he did wonderful. But he let it go on for seven years so that I would learn you don't play with the matches because it's very dangerous. And so this is a way to think about uh, the sin nature as opposed to the activities of sin and how they relate one to another. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, Paul is going to take some time and explain how we became dead to sin. Because he just said it as though we already understood it. But now he's going to explain how did that happen. And he begins by, with this, know ye not. He's going to use that phrase three or four times in this chapter. Know ye not. He says that with an expectation that the Christian already knows these things. And it's important for us as born-again people that we do know them, that we learn them, that we know them, and that we hold to them. He's saying, don't, don't you know? And so if we know it, I don't mean with just a head knowledge. I mean with the knowledge that is instinctual for you, that, that it becomes part of, of every thought that you have. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now concerning that uh, first phrase, know ye not, <clears throat> I'm looking at uh, Hosea chapter four, verse six, and I'll just read it quickly. God says through the old prophet, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowing that, for a lack of knowledge. 
And, and many times, I think most Christians, have, maybe not most, but very, very many Christians have never been discipled through the sixth chapter. They have the fire raging in their life. They got books of matches laying all over the house and they can't connect the dots to realize what is happening to them. And so, so they end up saying, well, it just doesn't work for me because they never was taught how it is supposed to work. I can remember as a young Christian in a legalistic church, never properly discipled, and I was having issues in my life. And I'm looking at everybody in church, and I'm like, what? How could they be perfect? Am I a spiritual midget, or what's wrong with me? And I thought it was me. And I didn't realize everybody in the church was a liar. And the pastor was a liar. Everybody was having issues. But they put on this air as though they were perfect. And one of the things in Christianity, we just need to be honest. Now, I don't, I don't suggest, you know, just confessing your sinful activity to the person beside you in the chair. But you do need to tell God and just, just say, hey, it is what it is. I'm still growing. I'm still trying to get there. So Paul says, do you not know that so many of us as were baptized, again, uh, the concept is submer the Holy Spirit submerges us into the body of Christ. So many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were in fact baptized into his death. Meaning that when the Holy Spirit submerged us into the body of Christ, he put us into union with Christ. So that when Christ was crucified on the cross, we were in union with him. When he was buried, we were in union with him. And when he was raised, we were in union with him. Christ's past becomes our past. Christ's future is our future. And so he's saying that as many, every single Christian, every born again person, bar none, that's been baptized into Jesus Christ, has been not just submerged in the body of Christ, but has been submerged into the death of Christ. That's how you died. How shall we that are dead continue to live in relationship with the sin nature? That's how we died. We evidence faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit submerged us into the body of Christ, and we're put in union with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Is everybody here? Okay. <clears throat> Again, this word baptize is, is simply means to immerse or to submerge, uh, or it, that was the primary meaning in the day that Paul used it. Now, let's look at this little phrase I have underlined here, into Jesus Christ. We're going to see this all over Romans, all over Pauline doctrine. You're going to see it in all of his letters. And you're going to see it in some of the other uh, apostles' letters. Because this is the way that the Holy Spirit, who inspired those men, takes a whole lot of theology, puts it into a small little phrase, and uses it everywhere. With the expectation that we know this. So that when we see the small little phrase, it unfolds all the theology, helping us to understand what we're reading. And so this little phrase in, in Jesus Christ, as we can see here from what I've already said, it means in what Christ has done at the cross. It means what in what Jesus has done for us at the cross. If you're in Christ, it means you're in what he did at the cross. You're in union with him. Now, as we look at the New Testament, it is amazing how many times this phrase or a, a variation of the phrase is used. I just looked up these six. In Christ, by Christ, through Christ, uh, in Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus. Uh, they're used some 112 times in the New Testament. And there are a number of other phrases exactly like this. And whenever you see one of these, for example, through Christ means through what Christ did at the cross. Are you with me? By Jesus, by what Jesus did at the cross. And if you'll train your mind to always read your Bible in that way, it will focus you properly uh, on Calvary and the importance of Calvary in your life. 
So let's just take a look at a couple of examples. Uh, here's one from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. It says, and we all know this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is the new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, you can just read through that, but if you don't do that translation, you don't get the full meaning of what uh, Paul is talking about here. But if you expand it, it would read this way. Therefore, if any man be in what Christ did at the cross. Are you seeing that? Well, well how, how do you be in what Christ did at the cross? You evidence faith. The Holy Spirit sees that faith and immerses you into the body of Christ. Now you're in Christ and you're in what he did at the cross, meaning that what happened at Calvary impacts you entirely throughout eternity future. It has that much of an impact on you. Here's another one that we can look at uh, quickly. First Peter 510. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. He's called us unto his eternal glory. How did he do it? By what Jesus, Christ Jesus did at the cross. That was the call. And everyone that responds to that call is called to God's eternal glory. So as you, as you read your Bible, if you see one of these little phrases, learn to identify them and always mentally let, expand that in your mind. It's talking about the cross. It's pulling my mind back to the cross. Again, this is not just Paul that does this. Well, this one is Peter because those men just wrote the epistles, but the Holy Spirit is the author and this is his motif to pack a lot, pack a lot of doctrine into a little phrase that people oftentimes read past because they don't understand it. Okay, let's get back to, let's get back to Romans. Verse four, therefore, <coughs> the rule of thumb is that when you see the word therefore, you need to stop and analyze what it's there for. Therefore means that everything that I just said is supportive for this that I'm about to say. And what he just said is that we're baptized, as many as were baptized into Christ, were put in union, baptized into his death. Therefore, based on that, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Do you get that? He's saying, okay, you've been submerged into him. You've been put in union with him at his death, and it, 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 it reckons death for you. Now, we are also buried with him. By baptism into his death. So that, get this now, he's saying here's the reason that God baptized you into his death. Number one, to, to uh, separate your relationship with the sin nature. Number two, to separate your relationship with the law. Number three, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, even we should walk in the newness of life. So he's saying that if you've been putting union in his crucifixion, you're in union with him in his burial. You are also in union with him in his resurrection, which means just like Jesus got out of the grave, he, he was different than he went in the grave. When he got out of the grave, he could just appear in the room. He could just walk straight through walls and just appear. He could appear in one form and then appear to somebody else in another form. He could be talking to a person that knew him uh, very well. I, who was, I believe it was Mary or Martha, one of them. They were, thought he was the gardener until he said, Martha. Was it Martha? It was Mary. Until he said Mary and she said, Rabboni. All of a sudden she saw him. So his body was different. Not only that, the Bible tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. His body didn't have no blood when he got out the grave. His blood was given for the life of the world. His body is powered by the Holy Spirit. And so just as Christ raised to this new experience, you and I, are, we're, are the likeness of our resurrection from the dead and our union with him means that we should walk in the newness of life. We have a new power source. We're no longer under the, the jackbooted heel of the sin nature that's causing us to say things that we know are wrong. How many's ever had that problem? <laughs> 
The, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit will, before you can say it, the Holy Spirit will pull, will tighten you up and you'll realize I, I'm, I'm living on a new power source now. My willpower is not how I live. I live based on the power of the Holy Spirit. So he says, uh, raised from the dead by the glory of God, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. It doesn't say we would. It says we should. You see, your free moral agency is still in play. Not only, you, you have to line your will up with the will of God. You have to realize that you're not under the dominion of the, of the sin nature, but you got a book of matches. And you got to quit striking them. Or else you get yourself back into a big mess. And rather than walking around striking the matches, trying to reinflame the sin nature, we should walk in the newness of life. We should walk in a new uh, experience. This term walk, it just means how somebody orders their lifestyle. It just means how, how, you, how you order your lifestyle. For example, uh, I, I didn't personally do this, but many people that before they got saved, they went to clubs and, you know, and got drunk and stuff. I got drunk, just not in clubs. <laughs> and then when they get born again, suddenly there's a newness of life. They don't want to go to the club no more. They don't want to drink no more. There's a, a new power source and they're headed in a new direction. Saints, that is born again. And I, I'm going to just say this. If, if there's a person who does not have that testimony that my life changed, it's because they're not saved. They may be ever so religious as Nicodemus was, but they're not born again. And, and you, can, you can join 15 churches. It don't help you. You got to go to Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can do it. Amen. So then verse 5 says, For we have been planted together. Now, again now, Paul is simply explaining in answering this first question, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? He's already told us, OK, you've been uh, you've been crucified. You've been buried. You've been raised in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He's saying this, that if a person is baptized into Christ. They will have a different walk. That's all this verse is saying. This verse is saying there's no exceptions. If we've been planted together, if we've been brought into union with him uh, in the likeness of his death, absolutely 100%, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, meaning that we walk in a new life. We walk in a new way. If we find ourselves going back to the other way, we were either never, ever born again or we're bad backslidden. <laughs> Amen. Now, one of the reasons that many preachers have stopped preaching this as the grammar lays it out is because it's not popular. You know, if you have a church of 5,000 people and 4,000 of them are just religious, they're not really saved. That's going to hurt the bottom line if you preach this. Because those people are going to look for a church where this is not being preached. And that's why many preachers just tell the audience just how beautiful they are and how rich they're going to be and uh, how much God just loves them. Uh, rather than to actually give them what the word is actually saying. This is line upon line, precept upon precept. A grammatical interpretation of what this word says. Verse 6. Knowing this. This is the second time that Paul has used this type of a phrase. Emphasizing the importance that you and I know something. Christianity is not an emotional religion. You, you may get emotional from time to time. But, but Christianity is a thinking religion. God created us as rational beings. He expects us to use, we got the best brain in our head that God put on this planet. Man is the most intelligent. He expects us to use this. 
and to rationally approach his word, approach him, and approach life. And so Paul is saying, knowing this, it's important that we know this. Know what? That our old man is crucified with him. So that the body of sin might be destroyed. So that we henceforth should not serve sin. Now he's laying out here, this, this is how it works. It does not work. If you've not been baptized with Jesus Christ, this won't work for you. If you've not been born again, if you've not been saved, this won't work. It's not a secret algorithm. You have to go to Christ first and be born again. But for those of us that are born again, he's saying we have to know this. We have to understand it. That our old man was crucified with him. It goes on to say it, the old man was crucified with him. Let's just define the old man real quick before we move forward. <coughs> the Greek word means the worn out fifth for the scrap file, for the scrap pile. They're just the, the worn out man, the, the old man that's just, um, you, you know how as we get older, our bodies tend to start falling apart. Has anybody experienced that or is it just me? <laughs> The old man, and I mean, the, the, the more we live in these, these human bodies, just, they just get ragged <laughs> over time. and They just don't function correctly. So he's saying, knowing this, that the old man, but the spiritual man, see, the spiritual man is in, unsaved person is in worse condition than the physical man. The old man is crucified with him. Why? So that the body of sin might be destroyed. What is the body of sin? The body of sin is the human body under the influence of the sin nature. That's the body of sin. The sin nature will express itself through the human body in sinful activities. And so God crucified us with Christ so that the body of sin would be destroyed. The word destroyed just uh, simply means to render idle or to cause it to cease. Meaning that the sin nature can no longer easily just function and express itself through our human body unless we play with the matches. We give him permission. And, and once he, he will ascend back to the throne of your heart if you let him. Here's the thing you have to understand. Every born again person, you got another law working in your members. It's not just you and Jesus. There is a hopefully dormant sin nature that is constantly trying to reach out and grab for something. <laughs> you, you can be, had just prayed that morning, th holy, thinking right, everything's good, and a half-naked person of the opposite sex walks right past you, and the sin nature will try to reach out. You might not actually touch the person, but mentally it'll reach out through your mind and if you romance that, you strike and matches. <laughs> you strike and matches, and you're going to get yourself in trouble. So then, he, the old man was crucified with Christ so that the, the human body, under the influence of the sin nature, might be destroyed, rendered idle, or caused to cease, so that, so that, from now on, we should not serve sin. Again, that word sin is a noun. It means the sin nature. The body of sin was destroyed so that we should not serve or be a slave to the sin nature. The word serve it is dulio in the Greek. It means to be a slave. Now, when you think about that, do, do, how many can remember back to when you were a slave to the sin nature? <laughs> you know, some people didn't ha don't have a... a um, didn't have a hard enough experience in sin. But the sin nature, when you look at the alcoholic who is drinking themselves to death, that's a person who is a slave of the sin nature. When you look at the people that are 
uh, dying on fentanyl and, and, or, or in some type of a sexual perversion, that is a person that is a slave to the sin nature. And the sin nature does one thing. It will use the body of sin. It will use the human body. But what the sin nature ultimately will do is the wages of sin is death. It will kill the human body. And if that person is not right with Jesus Christ, that is a death that goes on eternally. This is why it's so important that we know this and we understand how we are to operate so that when the sin nature is trying to uh, express himself, we understand, hold it. I'm no longer a slave to the sin nature. I'm not even live, walking in the old power source of my willpower. I, my new power source is the Holy Spirit and I'm going to begin to commune with the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit for Grace, I need some help, unmerited divine assistance. That's how you cease from sin. If you try to fight sin just based on your willpower, you will lose. You will lose. But if you will line your will up with the will of God, that allows the power of the Holy Spirit to come down, not to do what you want, but to do what he wants in you. Does that make sense? So if we use all those definitions and amplify this verse, it would read this way. <coughs> knowing that, uh, knowing this, that our worn out man, which is fit for the scrap pile, is crucified, rendered dead with Christ, so that the body of the sin nature might be rendered idle and caused to cease so that henceforth we should not be a slave to the sin nature. That, that amplifies that a lot, doesn't it? Here's a trick you can always do. If you go look up a word, take the definition of the word you looked up and put it in that verse and it just opens that whole scripture up. That's what we're doing here. It'll just open that scripture up for you. Verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And again, let's not lose track of the fact that Paul is answering the question, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? This is his answer. Isn't this one of the best answers you ever heard? The word for in the King James, often you can translate that because, and it'll, it'll flow better. Because he that is dead is free from sin. Meaning he that has been submerged with Christ, brought into union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection has been made free from the sin nature. That word is a noun, so we know it's the sin nature. Has been made free. Now, if we be dead with Christ, there is no doubts whatsoever, we believe that we shall also live with him. Meaning that if you're crucified with Christ, you are absolutely resurrected with Christ. And not only resurrected with Christ, if you'll remember, uh, 40 days after his resurrection, he was glorified. He ascended up into heaven. That's going to happen to us. He was given an immortal body, incorruptible. That's going to happen to us. We're in union with him. His future is our future. As a matter of fact, in the letter to the Laodiceans, he said to him that overcometh, will I give to set with me in my throne, even as I'm set in my father's throne. That's our future. We're in union with him. We're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Man, that's good news. So he, again, here he's saying, if we be dead with him, we believe we shall also live with him. The, the two, the crucifixion and the resurrection go together. If you've had part of the crucifixion, if the Holy Spirit has baptized you into Christ, Christ's future is your future. And matter of fact, he said, because I live, you shall live also. Verse 9. Okay, so let's back up. Let's back up. <clears throat> it's important when we're studying the scripture not to study verses 
Because in the original letter, there are no chapters and verses, and there's very little punctuation. And so don't, don't uh, partition the verses. They connect together. They're meant to connect together. And so what Paul is really saying is now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that, knowing that, meaning that if we're going to live this new life in Jesus Christ, if we're going to live the resurrected life with him, it is important that we know that we're knowing that Christ uh, being raised from the dead dieth no more. <laughs> he is forever immortal. Death hath no more dominion over him. Why is that? It's because the way, there it is, the wages of sin are death. Well, he's already died. That means death has no more dominion over him. But wait a minute. I, I'm, I'm in union with him in his death. That means death has no more dominion over me or you. Now, there's going to come a day you take this body off and praise the Lord. God's got a brand new one for you. And it's better. <laughs> I went to the dentist just this morning. There will never be a dentist with a new body because it doesn't corrupt. Did you realize that when you get a cavity, that's this body is decaying? It's already dying. Death is already set into it. It's already falling apart. The little baby, four or five years old, whenever they first start getting cavities, that's their body already decaying. But God has made these bodies so marvelous that we can still walk 60, 70, 80, 90 years before it totally falls apart. But the new body that he has for us incorruptible, meaning corruption cannot even touch it, immortal. But, but here's the point that I wish to make. Right now, you need to understand you are an eternal being. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That word creature in that passage is creation. He's saying if any man be in what Christ Jesus did at the cross, he is a new creation. It means that we're not just mere man the way that uh, uh, other unborn again people are. It means that we're a creation that never existed before. See, regular everyday men, they, they don't have a connection with God. They don't have a living spirit on the inside of them. But born again people walk all day long and they have a connection to the creator of all things. Think about this. As, uh, if, if you have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you speak in a language you never learned. Think about that. <laughs> We've been made partakers of his divine nature. Regular people, regular unsaved people don't have that. So we're a creation that never existed on the planet before. And so we can't expect the planet to love us because we're quite different. Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once unto sin. I'm sorry. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, that's Jesus' experience, but you and I are in union with Jesus, so that means that's our experience. In that we died with Christ, we died unto sin, that's a noun, it's the sin nature. We died in our relationship to the sin nature. He's no longer our master. We, we, have to, we don't, no longer have to have any, any doings with him. But in that uh, he died, we died with him, we died unto the sin nature once, and in that Jesus is alive, he liveth unto God, we're resurrected with him, we have now a relationship with God. We live in an everyday relationship with God. How many just talk to God all day long? Just, just all day long, just talk to him. That's a relationship. See, if you only talk to him, you know, once a week or when you bless your food, that's not a relationship. That, that's not normal Christianity either. You, you need to get to a place that you're talking to him all the time. 
When you wake up in the morning, he should be the first one you talk to. Verse 11. If I can get us there. There we go. Likewise, <coughs> reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's saying just like, just like Jesus, he died unto sin once, and then he, he's alive unto God. He goes likewise, just like that, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, Sin nature, just like Jesus, but alive unto God. And your relationship to God is alive. And it all came to you through Jesus Christ or through what Jesus Christ did at the cross. Now, this word reckon, it just simply means to conclude. To, uh, it's, 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 um, it's like the word reconcile. You know, when an accountant reconciles something, he has a long list of numbers and he adds all the numbers and they come down and it, boom, he cross foots. This is, my rec this is my recon right here. This is my reconciliation. There can only be one answer to a reconciliation. If you get three answers and you do it three times, it means two of the answers are wrong. And Paul has given us all this information in the sixth chapter of Romans, how we're uh, uh, crucified, buried, and raised with Jesus Christ. Now he's saying reckon. Now he's saying reconcile those facts. Think about everything that I've just told you and come to the right conclusion. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to the sin nature because of your union with Christ but alive unto God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord, on the cross. He's saying, reckon that. Now, it doesn't matter how many times you read the book of Romans, you need to read it again. <laughs> I need to read it again. I've taught this class any number of times. I need to read it again because we need help reckoning. Sometimes we can know things, but we never stop to do the, have you ever had a, I don't know if any of you still use checkbooks or a ledger, and, and you're doing it, and you, you don't reconcile at the end of the month, you just let it flow. <laughs> and then you just wonder, you bring up the bank account, the bank on online, you look at your bank online, and you look at your number, <laughs> and they don't reconcile at all. But Paul is telling us we need to reconcile these theological thoughts that we have because it makes it easier. It makes it easier uh, to cease the sinful activity that can impact us. So if we were to take those definitions and put them into this passage... <coughs> It would say, likewise, reason, compute, conclude, and take into account that you also yourselves are dead indeed unto the sin nature, but alive unto God through what Jesus Christ our Lord did at the cross. Isn't that wonderful how that just gets amplified? <laughs> Let not, now, now based on all that, he's... Paul is like a lawyer. He lays the groundwork. He gives you the information and then he hits a plateau and he makes a theological statement that can't be argued with because he's already laid the foundation like a lawyer. And he's now hit that plateau and he's saying, let not sin therefore, based on everything that I just said, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. This word reign speaks of uh, to rule as a king. And that's what the sin nature does. It, it rules the human body, the person who is under the dominion of the sin nature. It rules that person and has them doing what they don't want to do. Has anybody, can you remember? <laughs> Try to stop smoking dope and can't. Am, am I the only one? Because <laughs> y'all are looking at me like, oh, really? <laughs> you know, try to stop some sinful activity and you can't because you're being dominated by this one who will rule us as a king. It's the sin nature. Now, now, you, you cannot say God, the sin nature did it. 
You can't say that. Because when you go take your, the fingerprints off that alcohol bottle, that's, that's, your, that's your fingerprints on there. <laughs> so you can't say, oh, the devil did it. You can't, uh-uh. You and I created as rational beings, we need to know this so that we can begin to approach God correctly, not through works, but through just faith in what Jesus did for us. God, if I'm crucified with you, first of all, if I'm not crucified with you, Lord, save my soul. <laughs> and then if I am born again, then I'm saying, Holy Spirit, I need grace. You don't need help. You need grace. See, many times we'll say, God, I need some help. No, that, that means that God is helping you to do something. God don't need your help. <laughs> he just needs you to humble yourself and admit that you're incapable. I'm, I've run out of time, but I, I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, as a young Christian, I, I got on drugs, striking matches, striking matches until I got myself addicted uh, to crack cocaine. God left me hanging out there for seven years. I tried everything. I'm a smart individual. I've got a strong willpower. I got beat down for seven years. And finally, it got so bad, they put me into a, a home where crazy folks are at. And I mean, seriously, when I walked in, I could pe hear people howling down the, <laughs> down the hall, like a rehabilitation place. And um, I checked in, and they opened my luggage and took my belt. And I'm like, what are you doing? They said, well, you might hang yourself. They took my cologne. They said, well, you might drink it to get high. And I was so humiliated. And I went to the room they assigned me, and I just fell across the bed. And I said, God, I, I can't go any further. I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how I got here. I'm, I'm at the end. Just like that, I felt the Holy Spirit on the inside, and that addiction was broken in my heart. Just like that. God needs us to humble ourselves down. He's not going to have a problem <laughs> keeping his end of the bargain. It's you and I sometimes that, that get in his way. Okay, I am definitely out of time. Saints, I hope that you got something out of that. We'll pick up with verse, uh, we'll probably start here next week, verse 12, and just move forward. Uh, we're going to ask, Sister Carla, would you please come and receive our offering? Thank you, Pastor Lincoln. As we go through Romans and Pastor Lincoln, he's, as he's teaching it, it's like, I'm so glad that he studies and teaches it to us so that we can get the knowledge because if we're just reading it, then it's like, what does, what did this just say? And we have to read it again and again, and he just breaks it down so we can understand it better. That's why come Bible study is so important that we, that we get here and that we can learn. So if you would please prepare yourself for tonight's tithe and offerings. As you know, there are many ways to give. If you're online, just scroll down and hit the donate button. And uh, I have an announcement. This Friday, the 25th, is movie night here at the church. It starts at 7 o'clock, and if you have not had a chance to sign up, there is a sheet outside uh, on the table, and you can sign up. And it's going to be, uh, I, what I've heard, a very good movie. So if you want to come out to the movie, come on out. So if you would, please bow your head. I'm going to dismiss us, and we can get out of here. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for allowing us to come to a place where we can worship you and not be persecuted. We can learn of your word and get knowledge and grow from that. I just pray, dear Lord, that we just, what we have heard, that we do not quickly dismiss it, that we will keep it in our heart. We will learn of it and we can share it with others. I pray, Father God, as we leave here tonight, that you would give us traveling mercies and we will be back home, and that we can get back home safely. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.